The next of the seven needs with which God created us is a need for blessing and provision. The scriptural reference for this is Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. So many of us just take for granted that the God who created Adam and Eve would make sure they knew he'd provide for them. But remember, Adam and Eve were only human. Have you ever been told to do something, but you weren't sure if you had everything you needed to complete the task? Adam and Eve had just been given dominion to rule over everything. That was a big responsibility. Have you ever noticed when a husband gets a new job or position, the first thing his wife asks is, how much are you going to make? It's a legitimate question. Her motivation is one of provision. Will the kids and I be okay? Well, our loving Father made sure that Adam and Eve were certain about his provision for them. Our Father's character is intricately connected with providing for his children. One of his names is Jehovah Jireh, God the Provider. Because of the truth of that name, you'll find that your unwavering trust in him as provider is key to you receiving his provision. Let me repeat that. Because of the truth in that name, you'll find that your unwavering trust in him as provider is key to you receiving his provision. The God who created the whole universe has the right to be trusted by his creation. In fact, he commands this. All throughout scripture, we're constantly reminded to trust in the Lord. But negative life experiences can hinder your trust. During your childhood, if your real or perceived needs were unmet, then you may not think God is trustworthy as a provider. In other words, you may believe in God, but when it comes to trusting Him for provision, you're full of worry about finances. If you believe in our Lord, but don't trust Him, your mental acknowledgement is meaningless. Your belief is no better than that of the demons. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. James chapter 2, verse 19. When Sue and I first put our trust in Jesus, she was given a gift of faith. Do you know what the gift of faith looks like? She gets happier, the worse things get. It's only when God himself can answer that those with the gift of faith are truly happy. Sue never doubts our Lord about finances. She joyfully gives away whatever we have whenever He prompts her to. In our early days as followers of Jesus, I trusted that the Holy Spirit in her was guiding her. But I just couldn't overcome my worry about money. The year after we put our trust in Jesus, Mike resigned his commission after 10 years in the Navy. We planned to move from San Diego to Massachusetts to attend an interdenominational seminary. We put our home on the market with a realtor friend in California and purchased one near the seminary. Months went by as we paid the mortgage on both houses. Our savings were rapidly shrinking. One day I came home. Sue told me both mortgage payments were due. We had eight dollars to our name. I was flooded with fear. 
wondering how we could have missed God's will. <laughs> but Sue stood there smiling and said, go downstairs to the den and read the devotional I read this morning. The devotional was about a military officer crossing the Atlantic on a sailing ship in the 1700s with his family. A violent storm came up and his wife was deathly afraid. She asked her husband why he could be so calm in a storm like this. He pulled out his sword and put it to his wife's throat and asked, Are you fearful of this? She replied confidently, No, I know in whose hand the sword is. He replied with equal confidence, I know in whose hand the storm is. I sat there in tears, repenting of my lack of trust. A few moments later, the phone rang upstairs, and I could hear Sue going to answer it. Just then, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. That phone call is from your realtor in California. He's going to tell you that your house is sold. Now tell Sue this before she answers the phone. I yelled upstairs, Sue, that phone call is from our realtor. He's going to tell you that our house has sold. Yes, our house had sold, and the buyers wanted to move in immediately before closing. The house went into escrow so we didn't have to pay the mortgage on it. The buyers sent a check for rent that covered the mortgage on the home we were living in, and we closed in January in a year in which we had no income because Mike was attending seminary so we didn't have to pay capital gains on the price differences of the two houses. I was revolutionized by our father's lesson. I'd grown up in a very poor home where money was always a concern. As an adult, I was plagued by the strongholds of deceit and rejection, and I couldn't shake my worry about money. God had to blow me out of the water by bringing me to two mortgage payments and eight dollars, and a wife with a gift of faith. A few years later, while teaching at the retreat center, this lesson became encouraging testimony for others. We'd often ask people who were worrying about their finances, did it ever occur to you that if you're prone to worry about money, God may bring you reason to worry? That way you'll learn to repent of your doubts and trust Him. Your worry insults His character as God the provider. I can tell you with confidence a particular truth that the Bible reveals again and again. When our Lord's character is challenged, He'll do everything to make sure you don't defame His reputation. And He acts severely if He needs to. Blessing and provision are part of His character, and it's important you don't trample on them with doubt and fear. If you live with unconfessed sin, a stronghold of doubt and unbelief may cause you to distrust our Lord. As you'll see, renewal of trust and belief comes when you confess and repent of these breaches of intimacy with Him and demolish the agitating strongholds. One of the most common sins of those who don't trust God to provide is striving after wealth. What a hellish pursuit! People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Let's consider what we just read. By striving after money, some will depart the faith and hurt themselves grievously. Is this what you want for yourself? Making money your goal in life is just as insulting to our Father as when you don't trust Him to provide for your needs. Both paths lead to tragic results. But if you're not hindered by strongholds, you can avoid the pain. And you'll find in chapter 5, after you've demolished the strongholds, filling in the ruts of your old distrust, with godly trust brings great blessing to your heart. Our Father has also instilled in each of us a need for security. 
Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Security can be defined as confidence that you'll experience protection and relational warmth. Relational security represents those people with whom you feel at peace. Those whose affirmation helps you feel good about yourself. Just thinking about them brings you joy. Mm -hmm. The two most common strongholds that rob Christians from experiencing this type of relational intimacy are fear and insecurity and rejection. These are often found in people who have grown up in homes where there was addictive or compulsive behavior. Under those conditions of constant apprehension, they never knew when the peace would be shattered. Maybe your sense of security was destroyed because of a catastrophe, such as the death of a loved one or the sudden loss of financial stability. Studies show that children of divorce and many adopted children have extreme difficulty experiencing relational security their entire lives. The absence of secure relationship leaves people in a prison, an emotional concentration camp for years. They never seem able to draw close to other people in a way that they feel like they belong. As a result, many in their relationship with God never trust that He can accept them unless they're doing something for Him. They may hide behind a lot of conscientious behavior by always being involved in activities. What others aren't aware of is that these task-focused people are often driven by the need for recognition or success. There's an old saying, if you can't feel love, get recognition. It's sad that so many look for recognition in order to compensate for their lack of relational security. These people fill all kinds of leadership roles in many faith communities today and are plagued by constant fear of failure that keeps them pushing to achieve. Their ungodly pursuit often destroys many relationships. During Mike's 10 years in the Navy, he observed how destructive men who are besieged by a fear of failure can be. They're obsessed with such a need to succeed that they trample over everyone along the way. So years later at the retreat center, he created activities so that those who had a fear of failure could be identified and helped. We'd play basketball, volleyball, and other group games. I'd be on one team and put one of our staff members on the other team. Without the other players recognizing what we were doing, we had a unique way of letting the score get close. If we were playing a game of 15, for instance, we'd make sure the score got 13 to 13. The tied score incited those with a fear of failure to stop passing and hog the basketball. In volleyball, they'd stop setting others and spike the ball themselves. In each case, their fear of failure caused them to forget everyone else on their team and depend only on themselves. After the game, we'd sit around and talk about how everyone felt. Those who feared failure were pained to hear what they'd done to everyone else on their team. When they recognized what their fear of failure did to their teammates and repented of their actions, something wonderful began to happen. Relational security could begin to develop. We can assure you that relational security, both with God and with others, is the biblical glue that makes a sense of belonging real. Mm -hmm.